So good morning, folks. Um, we will start with uh, the Heart Sutra. So those who are here in the Gompa, it's on page eight. Start there. <clears throat> I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagawan was dwelling on Massa Vulture's mountain in Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration of the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also, at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharadvati Putra. Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odour, no taste, no object of touch and no phenomenon. There is no I element and so on up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond there, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the e mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata om gati gati padagati padasam gati bodhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagawan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharadvati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the worlds of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. I prostrate to the gathering of the Dakinis in the three chakras who abide in the holy yoga of using space. By your powers of clairvoyance and magical emanations, look after practitioners like a mother, her child. Akasamara Sashadara Samaria. Akasamara Sashadara Samaraya Pe. 
Tayata, Omgate Gate, Padagate, Padasam Gate, Bodhisoha. By the teachings of the three supreme jewels possessing the power of truth, may inner and outer hindrances be transformed, may they be dispelled, may they be pacified, may they be completely pacified. May all negative forces opposed to Dharma be completely pacified. May the host of 80,000 obstacles be pacified. May we be separated from problems and harmful conditions to Dharma. May all enjoyments be in accord with the Dharma and may there be auspiciousness and perfect happiness here right now. So then offering mandala, uh, page 15, is, uh, if you have our book. Sashi Purki Shukshin Metog Prahamari Rabling Shim Nihitik Yen Padi Sangi Dagi chin yen gi pe so nam ki dro la pan chi san ge dro pa shu. So sitting here, most <coughs> profound Mahayana motivation according to a refuge and bodhicitta prayer for engaging in our continuing exploration of the mind. <coughs> so last week, um, we, in a, by way of introduction, <clears throat> we were looking at the Buddhist definition of mind being clear and knowing, and then the aspect of continuity of consciousness and proofs for that. And so this week, uh, we'll go on to look at the Western models of um, the whole brain-mind debate. But before we do that, I just want to stay with, because towards the end, the time was a bit rushed, stay a little bit with the continuity of consciousness and, and go through some of those, you know, just summary bringing us back to where we were at the end. And then, you know, we'll do a brief meditation on that. And then we'll go on with the rest of the presentation. So that's the plan. <laughs> okay. So one of the things <clears throat> in terms of proof of continuity of consciousness is people's near death experiences. So that, you know, when people <clears throat> say on the operate, in the operating theatre and they report accurately, um, you know, different activities that happen um, when they've flatlined, say, 
And uh, even to the extent of, in, uh, they put this to the test, you know, um, drawing images and things on top of high cabinets in the operating theatres. And then people reported seeing those things, which you couldn't have seen unless you were somewhere up near the ceiling. <laughs> and, but also being able to report conversations that were had uh, while they were out for the count. So, um, so it sort of suggests that there's some conscious functioning, even when the brain shows no measurable activity. And I'd had first-hand experience of that. Well, not for maybe second-hand, because it wasn't me, it was my mother. <laughs> it wasn't first-hand. Um, twice, twice um, being clinically dead. And it's great if you have the opportunity to quiz somebody on that, because I noticed for my mother that particularly one time where we spent a bit of time afterwards and her whole demeanour had changed and there was sort of lightness and so forth. And um, anyway, she spoke about that experience about being this, you know, white light. Um, it was very peaceful and so forth. So as it was coming towards the end of her life, I would remind her, oh, remember just tell me again what that experience was. And it was more for her to keep it in her mind. It was very peaceful. And actually, as she came to the end of her life, she said, oh, just, just, she wasn't fearful of death. She said, it's just another step in the spiritual journey. And I thought, gosh, she sounds more Buddhist than me <laughs> as a Catholic mom. <laughs> she did like her medicine Buddha, <laughs> I have to say. Anyway, so... And we spoke about the neurosurgeon, um, um, Ibn Alexander, Proof of Heaven, and how he talked about his experiences. And all those experiences seemed to be in the, framed in the context of your own belief systems or value systems or so forth. Um, and I was also thinking, like, um, you know, some of my Aboriginal friends um, also mentioned that oh, I know when mum died because she came and sat with me in the car. Now, she wasn't physically there, but that sense of I knew she was dead because I had this conversation with her <laughs> in the car. So these are sort of, again, it fits within that belief system. So sort of experiences and phenomena that how do we explain these things? Also, we can see that, you know, the brain is not functioning during CPR, and yet we're able to resuscitate people. So it's not a, you know, the lack of brain activity is not a necessarily indicate death itself is not a death sentence, if you like. Um, also, we have examples. You may have different examples as well, and please contribute. Um, but. Uh, observing sudden lucidity in patients with dementia near the time of death where actually I was, I was thinking of um, a woman I knew who was well she wasn't so much dementia she was I think bipolar anyway she'd been in and out of psychiatric institutions throughout her adult life and uh, and I remember asking her one time um you know, how are you today? And she said, oh, what would I know? It depends on the drugs I'm taking. I thought that's the most lucid thing I'd ever heard her say. <laughs> so there was some lucidity there. Yes, um, Gunna Boyangchen. I also heard of someone who was in hospital and had a really, really, really bad infection and they were in hospital but just before they died, they were, but they'd been completely out of their tree. Just before they died, that like the day before, was able to have a sensible conversation with his wife and everything. So, yeah, Venerable Youngchen's also mentioning someone who, um, you know, also was, she says, out of his tree. Uh, so, but uh, the day before he died was able to have a very, you know, rational conversation with his wife. So there, I'm sure that people in the medical profession observe these things. And sometimes people think that, oh, the person's getting better because because of these things, but that it's just uh, a moment, you know. So many, many different phenomena can be observed. So it's good to keep our minds open to that. Also, we mentioned about 
took to the clear light mind of, of death of those um, beings who are experienced, um, we say, bringing death into the path, uh, who have control over that process in the sense that they decide before they die um, how long they want to stay in that clear light of death and what practices they want to do in that time. You know, I heard about one high lama who was like one and a half days in, in the clear light of death took them. And uh, when they reported it, they said two days, because I thought it was a bit awkward to say only one and a half days. But you think, I mean, my comment was he, he probably didn't have much to complete. You know, <laughs> we can look at it from many different aspects. So it's not much good. I know the, the, the opportunities I've had of, of being around Geshe's who've stayed in that clear light of death and one was 10 days and one was five days. And you say, well, how come that was 10? And that was, we don't know what they're doing, their practices, that's up to them. Um, and then, you know, as his Holiness Dalai Lama is very interested in, in doing these studies and actually in the PowerPoint, um, the slides for today, I've given a couple of links to, um, to some YouTube um, viewings of that. Um, and so the EEG data on those individuals who were recognised as, um, as being in Tugtum post-mortem, you know, they're recognised by lay Tibetan practitioners, by the medical profession, and by the lamas, religious paraspecialists, um, with no EEG waveforms discernible. And they couldn't find any support for residual brain activity, which is when you're usually declared dead. Um, and, you know, up to beyond 26 hours post-mortem. There was one case um, where the uh, blood pressure of the body was measured and it was around 86, which is quite close to a living being. So. It's interesting because you wouldn't think to, if somebody's clinically dead, to check their blood pressure. I've never seen, well, I haven't that often been there when the doctor has um, checked for confirmation of, of death, but when they have, they don't from memory check blood pressure. Um, and uh, so actually there was one nurse, uh, doctor, and she was checking under here. I said, why are you checking there? Um, might have been on the left hand side because it was like there might be a subtle heartbeat so she checked here anyway I tried to talk her, to her about the idea about mind and brain and she wasn't interested <laughs> she just wanted to sign the form <laughs> um, and the as, as we mentioned last time the suppleness of the skin you know when we look at the death process that we go through and familiarize with that. And when, um, you know, you pinch the skin and it stays up and the luster goes, that's pretty early on. But here in these cases, that's still got that sheen, that suppleness of the skin of a, you know, undecomposed state. Um, and uh, also that related to internal organs, not yet decomposing, face glow, warmth of the body. And they say a very sweet smell. Um, so, and this case, there was, um, mm, there was significant activity. This was a case in Taiwan of a Tibetan Lama in Taiwan. And um, there was some neural activity of the brain on a couple of the days. So, but it's not enough to, to, to make a valid um, case, I guess. And also, as, as we said last time, I don't want to upset the medical profession too much. Um, we also talked about the um, children's memories of past lives, just ordinary, shall we say, ordinary children, um, diverse cultural backgrounds, social status, um, belief systems, and so forth. Um, and nonetheless, to some sort of memories. And, um, and then we have, you know, our recognized reincarnate lamas and uh, of course their memories from past life. And then that gets all the processes to affirm, yes, this is the reincarnation of that one and so forth. So we have 
we have those. I remember Prince Hog Rinpoche being asked when, when he was, um, you know, here, you know, before he went to Sarah J. So around, he was just 11, 12, wasn't he? At 12 going on 30. And uh, someone asked him, uh, can you remember your past life? And he just said it was easier when I was younger because about seven or seven years old, it seems to be that, that those memories um, fade, which is sort of like you're more in, engaged in this life and so forth. Okay, so let's just see for ourselves from our own, in our own mind lab, we'll do a brief meditation capturing our own sense of continuity of consciousness, if we can, if we can, to get a sense of that experientially. So I'll lead you through a brief meditation and just see what we can experience, okay? Some of you may be quite familiar with doing um, meditations on continuity of consciousness. It's really, really helpful. Um, okay, so sitting or However you are, you can sit, you can lie, you can be comfortable. Uh, a conducive meditation posture that so that you're well supported, well grounded to the earth below. You feel a stable support from the chair, the cushion, the mat, the floor, whatever surface uh, you're resting on and feel that coming up to support you so that the muscles can be relaxed, be soft. And the spine, one long line, whether you're lying, sitting or in between. And invite your mind to settle into the space of the body and experience that sense of balance and ease. simply focusing on the breath just in its natural rhythm to bring your mind into a more meditative state in the space of the body. Within that space, just notice your present awareness in this moment. Whatever arises to your awareness. And then we can start to track back our mental experiences. This is not to relive any past moments it's to get a sense of that continuity that a moment of mind can only come from a previous moment of mind a previous moment of mind so see if you can track back to the moment before now or even being aware of the present moment is already like a past moment and then maybe Track back to you know, your activity and preparing for this session today and what you were doing earlier. Not as again, not to relive, but to get a sense of continuity, that, that continuity through memory or so forth, to be able to track back previous moments. So you could track back to, you know, maybe you had breakfast, an awake consciousness, and then before that, a sleeping consciousness. Maybe you were dreaming. See if you can recall that aspect of awareness while asleep.
I'm tracking back to before you went to bed last night. And keep tracking back <clears throat> previous moments, previous moments. Again, not to relive your whole life. <laughs> Simply to note the connection between one moment of consciousness and the other and see how far back you can track back. Maybe moments of your, your youth or childhood or so forth pop, pop up and awareness of that connection of consciousness. Awareness of maybe, maybe we're not aware of the time of birth apart from whatever stories we've heard about that, that sort of become our experience, even though we weren't aware, maybe. Can we track back beyond that? Before this life? As the Buddha said, how far back can you cognize? Just be aware. It's not to test out how far we can, simply to get that sense of continuity, connection of all these mental experiences. Maybe it gets a bit vague and hazy, <laughs> not sure. So bring yourself back to the present moment and just rest with your awareness in the present moment as it is. And be aware of continuity of mental moments in the present, becoming past moments. So not only do we have the experience of retrospective memory, we also have prospective memory. We can project forward because of the continuity of consciousness. We can think, you know, oh, when I go home, I've got to remember to go to the shop or whatever it is. This is an exercise in proceptive memory of projecting forward. We make plans, we make all sorts of things. The future hasn't happened yet, so everything is possible. So just see, you know, see if you can trace that continuity forward into the rest of today, even further ahead, and you can create whatever story you want because <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. But we have a sense of continuity into the future. See if you can capture that moment by moment. merely to get that sense of continuity. And then bringing yourself back to the present moment. Let's see whatever clarity you have about a continuity of a mental continuum through your direct experience. Okay, then. When you're ready, open your eyes, adjust to the light sights around you. 
So hopefully there's some sort of taste or aspect, even though that was a very quick, we can spend a lot of time on this. Maybe we do spend a lot of time ruminating on the past. In fact, it's just said, but in it, not to go over and ruminate about things, but to get a sense of that continuity. And uh, when I was in um, at Doje Chung uh, in Auckland in um, 2006, Lama Zopa Rinpoche was teaching and he pointed out a monk who was there and he said, he remembers his last life. So I guess Rinpoche could affirm it wasn't some exotic thing he'd made up. <laughs> it was authentic, uh, his past life. So, uh, yeah, so just never know who's around you really do you? <laughs> um, yeah so last week I think people who were received the email we had some questions to contemplate and the questions this is not to say have you looked at them <laughs> the question maybe you haven't because maybe you didn't receive the emails um, but the questions came from this, um, I think also there was a link to the ABC article from the Centre for, I think, Consciousness Studies at Monash University, new one. Um, the questions that they're saying we can interrogate and research. So, um, so the the first one and if anyone has any response either because you've thought about it or you haven't <laughs> but you have an idea was how are we consciously aware of ourselves how are we consciously aware of ourselves are we consciously aware of ourselves maybe it's a tough one that one but it's a good one to think about no one got any feedback from your experience okay well let's try the second one i think the second one's easier yes yes ourselves yes through the senses is a very big way our senses give us a lot of feedback don't they and then we our experience of that becomes a a, a mental experience right because we know everything through mind but it's through on the basis of very much i mean probably most of our sense of awareness consciousness is through the senses you know absolutely um so it's an area of investigation if you want to research further you can uh, sign up for monash university research team um well i don't know if you can actually <laughs> okay so the next one I think this one might be, a, well, I'm going to say it's a bit easier, but you might not think. How can we consciously engage in an active way to change ourselves? I say it might be easier because it's what we talk all, all the time about in Buddhism. Again, it's an area of investigation. How can we consciously engage in an active way to change ourselves? With meditation. With meditation. Well, being mindful Active listening to the teachings mindful being mindful be oh sorry libby yes. <laughs> I, I heard this voice coming from somewhere <laughs> being mindful yes yeah. mindful on the cushion off the cushion mm. yeah so we have many aspects mental factors that enable us uh to do that isn't it yeah, yeah. In thoughts of intention, when we look at the omnipresent um, um, mental factors and intention and attention and so forth, move, moving the mind towards the object, but our intention is, well, of course, coming from a Buddhist perspective, absolutely, is vital to everything, isn't it? So that, that we intend to change and we need that conscious intention for change to happen, isn't it? or at least to set the direction for that to happen. <laughs> okay. Um, if I want to change something, it, it, is, it is good to 
Okay, so one way is invest. Yeah, investigating, analyzing the advantages of changing something, whatever that is, and the disadvantages of not doing that, weighing up the consequences and making an informed decision, isn't it? So we use our um, cognitive abilities for that. Yeah. Okay, so through cognitive abilities, through intention, mindfulness, and different mental factors. Um, and how does consciousness then connect to action on that basis? Through setting a motivation. Through setting a motivation. Hi, Sandy, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, sorry, I had trouble getting in this morning, so I was a bit late. I started oh. early, <laughs> but yeah, hello. Yeah, see. setting a motivation at the beginning of the day and then... Um, connecting through reflection and and maybe even like I find through study, like having things study. to look at. Yeah. yeah. And like, for example, the 16 guidelines, setting maybe a, a task or a focus. So, and then reflecting, being mindful. Yeah. yeah. So they both complement each other. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So these are good things to investigate for ourselves. As I said, this is, you know, what they're researching. Yeah. Um, I had to have like really bad things physically happen to me before I was ready to think about changing my mind. Yeah, so it's often that we have to have bad things happen before I think I've got to make a shift here. Yeah. Yes. Especially illness. And illness. Like doctors saying, oh, yeah, okay, oh, we don't know what it is and we don't know why it happens. And the effort to kind of get Yeah. I decided to you know, make up mind that was the cause of this illness. At least you can work with the negative states of mind and then you've got some tools, thankfully, to do that. So, yeah, it's often, um, I mean, it's often why people come to Dharma centres is like, things aren't going well for me. <laughs> There's got to be something better than this. Big challenges and little challenges, but big challenges might get you here. Very big challenges, yes. Life's one very big challenge. <laughs> um, okay. All right, so good to continue to contemplate these things. And so now we're moving, shifting on to um, looking at the mind according to, shall we say, modern science or the scientific views. Um, so let's start with a uh, dramatic um, quote from Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking seems to have played a very sort of, shall we say, devil's advocate type role, if I can say, that sort of role of really putting things out there. So he makes some pretty, he made some pretty dramatic statements. So this was at a Google conference in 2011. He said, philosophy is dead. It's a bit like when Nietzsche said, God is dead. And you went, oh, well, think about that. Philosophy is dead. What he's pointing out that philosophy hasn't kept up with the developments in, in modern science. Um, and that he says the scientists have become the torchbearers to discover our quest for knowledge and, um, and give a very different view of the universe, our place in it and so forth. So relating this to the mind then, the mind according to science and Last week, I made some reference to William James, one of the very early, I guess, investigators of this area of the mind. So being very early investigator, he didn't have a lot to draw on. So in 1902, so yeah, well over a century ago, Varieties of Religious Experiences, it's really, I, I just think it's fantastic to to look at. And it, William James, William James, who's American, well, maybe before psychology was psychology, you know. <laughs> um, he was, a, and his brother, probably more well known, Henry James, the writer. Yeah, that's his brother. So, two very smart people, brothers. Yeah. 
He said, nature in her unfathomable designs, unfathomable designs, notice, not to be known, has mixed us of clay and flame. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's coming from a Christian background. Of brain and mind. Okay. That the two things hang indubitably together and determine each other's being. So that's that's quite interesting. It's quite a radical thought that brain influences mind and mind influence brain. Because at the time that was not a view. Um, and even today, as we'll see as we go on. But how or why, no mortal may ever know. So that was rather a conclusive statement, definitive statement. So one of the things he, he talked about the need for introspection. So he, he was aware of the idea of introspection, but he didn't believe or didn't know how we can access that. Whereas today we have a lot better understanding of the function of introspection. But it, you've got to think this was early days in the development of, of mind science. You've got to think that the mind sciences came on the, you know, late to the picture, the, the early scientific um, investigations that started with astronomy, didn't it? So hard sciences observable out there in the universe. Yes, then we enter. James was talking about subjective experience but not being able to think of that as being science. Yeah, there is the idea, and even today, you know, when we're this whole topic of the mind, that if we really want to know the mind, we've got to meditate. You know, it's through the first-hand personal experience. And so, of course, the tends to be this idea, this belief that has been pervasive about objective um, scientific observation. We've got some further quotes about that. Whereas, whereas really, and this is like still arguing the fact these days that if you really want to know that, it's got to be through subjective experience. And that's why I find it very interesting now I've been leading some meditations for the um, Centre for Contemplative Studies at Melbourne University, which is just opened at the end of the year, last year, or launched at the end of last year. And um, they've been having a series of, of people, you know, leading chunks of meditation for their staff and students. So that's nice that they're starting that from the ground up, their students and staff personal experience of meditation, you know, once a week at least once a week, <laughs> what they do in the meantime is up to them, you know. Actually, they're not forced to do that either. Yes. Continuity of consciousness regarding sleep, yes. Yeah. Yes, when you wake up, yeah. I tried to do that when I woke up one morning going like, oh, the clarity goes and the clarity comes back when I wake up. Great. So it felt like there was some sort of heavy element that yep. stayed and yep. the lighter element yep. that kind of came and went. And also my husband the other morning, he said he woke up by a very intrusive thought just going like finger on his head. Yep. He was like, oh, woke me up. So yes. I was wondering, sorry to interrupt, but no, 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 please. This is good. Yeah, so I did. I, in, I, I gave the invitation and thank you for uh, uh, taking it on to the, um, you know, into your week of, you know, observing as we go to sleep, the mind, and you, you mentioned like a feeling of heaviness and so forth. So, yes, this is um, that first stage that happens of the sort of, we say that, um, earth element dissolving so that and then with that the eyes go blurry and foggy or you know they we're very that's very observable even before we go to sleep and if we can keep going we might observe more and more you know subtle levels of 
if, if you like, losing sensory consciousness, all right? And then, as you said, at the other end, the sense of lightness, waking up, um, and then your husband being woken up by an intrusive thought that there would be boom, immediate clarity, which might also be when the alarm goes off, you know, oh, I'm awake. <laughs> um, but if we can, you know, sort of track that, and even before we get up, or at least before we move, you know, that first waking state, to even track back, like we did very, very briefly in this meditation, can we track back even the previous moment or of dreams? Because a lot of the um, dreaming state is, is towards, you know, as we're waking up. And can we track back into that and just be aware of that? Um, and then there's whole other practices where it's like when you're dead asleep, you know, turn the light of lucidity on and sort of, no, I don't want to be lucid, I want to be asleep. <laughs> but at least we can top and tail it, you know, from as we're falling asleep and as we're waking up. And so it mirrors what happens at the time of death. Only at the time of death, we don't wake up in the same body. We wake up somewhere else. So it's also useful as a, as a familiarization of that, but just even to see that loss of clarity of consciousness and that re-embodying of clarity of consciousness as we wake up, it's a very wonderful experiment. We can, we can all do that. Yeah, very good. Okay, very good. Keep experimenting. <laughs> okay, so, so one of the theories looking at here of, um, well, it's an ongoing debate of mind-body dualism. And this one is that both minds and brains exist but they exist independently, right? Mind and brain are independent. No mind is a brain, no brain is a mind, nor is the mind any part of the brain or the brain any part of the mind. We might say, I think as we go through these, it's good to see, do I agree? Do I have some qualms about this? What would be the consequences of this? right? But if we, we think about it, is that so far from a Buddhist point of view that says mind is not physical and body is, so they are different substances, right? So anyway, it's for us to investigate. Um, so this is, uh, anyway, the um, if you haven't got the slides, you can send an email and we'll get them sent to you, um, which has all of this information. Uh, this is from a book called The Mind and the Brain. Uh, Jeffrey Schwartz and Sharon Begley, who really look at all this, you know, sort of context and research and so forth. If there's a single underpinning in intellectual tradition of Western scientific thought, it is that there exists an unbridgeable divide between the world of mind and the world of matter, unbridgeable divide between the realm of the material, which is definitely real. Why? It's measurable. It's quantifiable. It's observable. So therefore, it's fact. Okay. And the realm of the immaterial which according to the conventions of science is likely illusory. In other words, made up. So we like the term illusory in a certain context in Buddhism, but this is not what is being referred to here. We say illusion-like, and we've got no problem with that. Um, but this is a very different context of that, and it's saying, it's sort of saying there is mind, but then it's actually contradictory in saying there isn't mind because it's all just made up, you know. Mm -hmm. Feel free to debate at any time because that's what we're doing. Um, and then we have the most pervasive theory, that being of scientific materialism, right? 
that everything has to be measurable to be valid and so forth. That the mind, so in that context, in relation, the mind is the brain, nothing over and above the brain. That's it. And so all the experiments that are being done, like with electrodes on the brain to measure brain waves, and that's useful. There's a lot has been learned, but that that's where it all happens. And I remember again seeing some little clip. I, I haven't, I can't remember what it was a program on television many, many years ago with Stephen Hawking. Um, and they're stimulating different parts of the brain and saying that's the emotion center, that's the this center, that's the that center. And of course, we have, you know, many different theories of the brain and what centers. Um, operate there but it's saying it's only the brain and then we looked at well we mentioned in brief last week like what happens when somebody born with you know no brain empty brain cavity and yet they're able to function it doesn't make sense if it's all dependent on the brain right so we can challenge that i mean feel free to challenge away Anyway, we're investigating these views. So um, thinkers like um, Hobbes, so we know Hobbes from being a political philosopher, um, 17th century, but also was, had vast interests in history and uh, uh, socio-political ideas and ge geometry even. So Hobbes and Lemaitre, Lemaitre was a 18th century French physician and philosopher who had the idea that humans operate like a machine and um, mental thoughts are based on bodily actions. I mean, we would say the other way around, wouldn't we? We'd say that, you know, the mental, you know, mind is the forerunner of all. Whereas this is saying the opposite, it's sort of saying the body is the forerunner of all. And this view is not uh, dead in the water. I was, um, this week I was watching a self-care summit. Well, I only watched uh, one and a half sessions, I think. Um, you know, good, just didn't have the time. And this particular presenter, I think, I think she's written a book called The Body is the Brain, something like that, whereas everything is based on, based on the body. So, yes, we know, we know a lot about our experience through the senses, but from her point of view, it's like the body is the actual brain, right? And there's many, many different views similar to that and I know um, there was um, in the 1920s Mabel Ellsworth Todd talked about she was actually a dancer but the thinking body and actually it was quite interesting her views and even I guess if I think about when I was um, training in Feldenkrais which is all based on bodily um, functions and so forth it, but it gave you a very good sense of embodiment so we can't sort of dismiss that but look at I guess where the emphasis is you know um, so this is like the mainstream of um, of science a consensus position that mind truly is in essence nothing but matter right? And our sub sub subjective experience that mind is something special or different is just an illusion. So that the mind is entirely, completely derived from the brain's matter. Fine with that? Yeah, most likely. Yeah, most likely. We sort of give a bit of leeway there. <laughs> No, science hasn't proven the non-existence of mind. So then you have to correlate it to something that you can prove the existence of. 
Well, at least that's what they're doing. You know, a brain, the brain is a part of the body. There's a lot of other parts of the body as well. So hence, other people positing different, you know, the thinking body, the gut feeling, the this, the that. And if we look historically, I can't quite remember all the different views from the Greek philosophers and so forth about mind and brain, but all in different parts of the body. Right. And he was meant that as a child of his dentist, he was as a child of his best friend, he was not like Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so there's some kind of cellular memory. There is cellular memory. That's really interesting, as you're saying, Leslie, that, you know, this guy at the retreat got welts on his arm during the retreat, and it was a memory. It, it reminded him that as a young child, you know, being. Um, whipped or caned or so forth on, on his left hand because he was left-handed trying to force him to write right-handed, which thankfully doesn't happen these days. Um, actually, a, a friend of mine um, similarly had an experience with welts coming out on his thigh and it reminded him of where he'd been beaten as a child and so forth. So we yes, there's definitely cellular experience. I know when I was training in Feldenkrais and uh, and with people, which is, as I said, a body modality. And um, at, at one point I developed a theory that um, because a lot of people with like frozen shoulder and so forth, I, I, I said, it stored anger. That was my belief until you realise not everybody, it doesn't pervade. <laughs> it doesn't pervade. You know? Of course we do, you know, tense our shoulders and so forth. For, well, it can be for many reasons. Um, but, you know, we adopt these notions because we see it a few times and then we think, okay, it's provable, you know, and then somebody else comes along and refutes you, which is really good. <laughs> very new agey though, isn't it? Very new agey, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people like to, yeah, sort of, it's just like, just go to the doctor and get it treated. <laughs> it's a body problem. <laughs> Yeah. 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 There's lots of different notions out there. Um, and then uh, the another uh, theory is that of functionalism, that a mind is a set of states essentially causally related to sensory inputs, behavioral outputs, and one another. Again, we could say, well, yeah, there's some truth in that, but we wouldn't say that is only that, and that's the difference. Because in the functionalism view, it's the idea of the brain is a computer. And here again, quoting Stephen Hawking, um, he says, the brain is a computer, this is this functionalism, which will stop working when its components fail. So this is going back to like Lemaitre's idea of the human being like a machine or the brain being like a machine. And, you know, when I was first interested to um, um, inquire, at least, I didn't go and study that at New South Wales University when they had um, cognitive science and uh, Peter Slezak was the director. This is many, many, uh, yeah, many years ago, a few decades ago. And that idea of the brain being a machine was that's the view they held. And in fact, I remember seeing images of the brain like a car or something like that, you know, making something very solid. And then I think we had something like a, um, it was hormonal. The brain operated on hormones or something. Anyway, there's many different views. Um, and it's interesting that idea that the brain will stop when its different components fail. Because this fit of it, you know, when I was a, a child and I thought, was this just to stop you from drinking alcohol? We were, we were told that if you get drunk, your brain cells will die and never be replaced. <laughs> anyway. That's yeah, this was a long time before neuroplasticity. Thank you. Thankfully, we can reconnect synapses and so because good news is coming <laughs> but that was that 
And uh, also, um, Stephen Hawking, this is interesting, the concept of an afterlife is a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. This led me to a profound realisation. There is probably no heaven and no afterlife either. We have this one life to appreciate the grand design of the universe, and for that I'm extremely grateful. Well, I can say I'm extremely grateful that Stephen Hawking at least used his one life for amazing advantage, which we can not agree with everything, right? So we look at the implications, if that's your belief, that there's only one life. You know, what's the implication of that? Of course, we look at that a lot in Buddhism. On the other hand, someone else who believed that it's by way of contrast, Kerry Packer, you know, there's only one life. There's nothing when you die, nothing. Uh, he lived his life a bit not quite so ethically, <laughs> shall we say. He did come close to death many times. I don't know what he made of it, whatever experience, because whatever experience you have is in accordance with your he belief system. He said, yeah, it's all, there's nothing. There's nothing. Yeah. Well, if you're going to have one life, you want it to be as long as possible, I guess, yeah. in his case. <laughs> yes. I appreciate even talking probably. He says probably. Probably. Yes, yes probably. pointing out all the, all the um, you know, he's, he's not making a definitive right. statement. Probably. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> so, um, I think it's just the case. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, and so many people have suffered in their life, they just think that the purpose of their life is to be happy, but they're amazed when it's dying. No, no, no. Because they cope. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, he, uh, yes, he dealt with motor neuron disease and, yeah, look at, yeah. So he made a, I mean, on the, you know, sort of make the most of your one life in a positive way. Um, so functionalism, or it's also called mentalistic materialism, all these big words, you don't have to know them all, denies that the mind, again, is anything more than brain states. It's just a byproduct of the byproduct of the brain's physical activity so then we have to look well what's the implication when we die we're leaving that body behind we're leaving the we're leaving the brain behind so you have to not believe in future lives to hold that view because it's contradictory otherwise you know so then how do we account therefore for say human history um you know what other objections can we raise? Or we say, oh, I've experienced the continuity of consciousness. <laughs> okay. Now, um, another interesting view is panpsychism. Yeah. This is what I call the cosmic consciousness view. That mind or a mind-like aspect is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of reality. That the mind is described as a theory that the mind is a fundamental feature of the world which exists throughout the universe. So saying that going beyond just being the body or so forth, it's everything that exists. I say, um, David Chalmers, he's an uh, Australian uh, philosopher who grew up in Adelaide. He says, perhaps consciousness is fundamental building block like space, time, gravity, mass, etc., electromagnetism. So we can see what he's, 
anyway, no, delete. If, there, if so, there is a need to connect consciousness with other fundamentals, discovering universal laws of consciousness. So this panpsychism, every system, everything that exists, if you like, is, is conscious. And there was a reference to, I haven't, I watched a little bit of the film called Fantastic Fungi. And it's about that, that sense of um, the living consciousness of the earth, if you like. I mean, I'm putting my simplistic way of saying that. And there is a sense of, there is some subtle, definitely subtle energies that pervade all the elements external as well as internal. So we can sort of think what connection there might be. And it sort of resonates with William James as well, um, a, a, a later book, Some Problems of Philosophy. He said um, he had this sort of interpretation, that experience that one ascribes a psychic aspect to all of nature. So sort of consciousness of all of nature. So it's interesting. I mean, I don't know if this was the foundation of chaos theory. You know, something happens here and there's a consequence on the other, you know, butterfly flaps its wings and there's a consequence on the other side of the world or so forth. Um, but, you know, it's, it's worth investigating these. It's sort of a, this sense of one cosmic consciousness that everything arises from and dissolves into and it's interconnected. I don't really understand when people say cosmic consciousness is a bit too cosmic for me. <laughs> but anyway, it's a view. Well, I mean, I like to, it's, see, it depends on our belief system because I, I like to um, connect Aboriginal worldview with dependent arising, the interdependence of everything. But I see what you mean in terms of, yes, the, con like the, the, you know, if my country's well, the land's well, I'm well, yeah. my community's well, and everything, the culture's well, and that you use a re, um, revitalizing the energies um, of through song and dance of, of certain areas of you know, your country to keep the culture alive. So maybe, maybe there's some connection there. It's well worth, yeah. I am my country, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 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 I mean, the whole stories of creation, of um, you know, the rainbow serpent and, and so forth, forming the land formations. Yeah. I think I remember reading one article that stuck with me. Paddy Rowe. Uh, I think he was up in the Kimberleys. Hmm. Broom. Broom. Yeah, and touching a rock. Actually, I think also in you see in Chinese um, philosophy as well, and touching the rock and connecting it to the memory of all his ancestors in the land, in that land, and so forth. So I think we have views like that. You know, we go to historical sites and so forth. Certain energies there. I mean, we can say that there's an influence of the mind on, on certain areas. This is why we do pilgrimage and we go to areas where it's exquisitely still through the power of the great yogis of the past. And it's still like, you know, go to Shravasti where the Buddha did 25 years rains retreat. So, you know, three months, three weeks and so forth every year for 25 years. And it's still that very calming, cool, exquisite environment where you sit to meditate and you go, wow, that's an amazing meditation. <laughs> mm. So, yeah. Um, so the assertions of the materialistic view, the mind of a human in earlier stages of development is a product of physical substances contained in the sperm, ovum and substances of the parents. So what sort of refutation do we give to this? 
I mean, I can certainly look at my family and see that um, while we had all the same conditions growing up, we have certain different areas of expertise or not um, and so forth and follow different life paths, etc. So how come if we if it's just come from the sperm and ovum or even our physical appearance, you know? Two blonde head, two red head, two dark head. <laughs> Example. I mean, we can refute. Of course we do. Um, and also that um, from the materialistic view, this sounds pretty depressing, human beings do not have authentic free will since all thoughts and decisions are an outcome of physical processes in the brain that are beyond one's control. Now, I guess if you held that view, you would have to assert that. We might feel that it's beyond my control, but we know it's possible. Yes. Um, science has a um, field of epigenetics now. I epigenetics, so, yes. So you, you have the same genome as maybe you know, your, your twin. Yeah. Um, but what happens in your mind determines on whether they're switched on or not. So you can have a stressful experience and certain genes get switched on and others. Ah, so they yeah. studied um, two, two twin sisters, for instance, or twin studies in general, they were sisters or siblings, and uh, one of them was severely overweight and the other one was, and the overweight one had kind of a very stressful, traumatic experience, and the, but the other one didn't. So right, right. Her mind, her experience, her interpretation of that yeah. experience that led to these yeah yeah so it's an interesting point in the studies on twins because you expect twins to be closer in their experiences um, but the responses to a stressful situation very different even though they had the same condition and this is the field of epigenetics so yeah saying there has to be a mental component there in terms of and this is what we work with isn't it you know how am I reacting to that same set of circumstances? And you know, I can change that way of responding, reacting. Yeah, yeah. So, and the so the thing about free will. So, just to contrast this with William James, William James had a um, lot of debilitating illness, and one time after two years of basically being bedridden, he said, my first act of free will is to assert the existence of free will. <laughs> <laughs> so even though he had debilitating illness, he wasn't doomed, you know. <laughs> so again, it, it asserts, it's how we respond, doesn't it? Um, okay, so further on, a few more on the uh, uh, materialistic view before we challenge even more. Um, so, the activity of the mind cannot be a cause of changes in the brain. The activity of the mind cannot be a cause of changes in the brain because mind is only a result of activity in the brain. So this remains a pervasive um, belief till today, even though, you know, in neuroscience, those beliefs are being challenged, but that assertion even exists strongly within neuroscience, right? Because, you know, they, or even though many scientists are questioning that view in the light of, scientific evidence, which is why we have, which is why it's exciting all the mind and life conferences with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and these scientists and so forth. Um, it's accepted, but how it's interpreted. Yeah, because neuroplasticity is based on measurement of the brain. Like, and 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 seeing about how we can rewire, you know, neural pathways and 
activate synapses and so forth and change change the brain but whether that's as a consequence of mind you know so that debate yeah so that made me think of the ptsd ptsd yeah yeah and then mind seems to habituate yeah well it says well you know when we look at further ahead that, that the mind can change the brain that in those examples like PTSD, it can have that detrimental effect on neural pathways, you know, too. So, yeah. Yeah. But this is, anyway, the materialistic view. Um, without brain activity, a person cannot have mental or experiences or awareness. So here, of course, we have those examples like in Trugton, like in, you know, at the beginning, you know, sort of saying, well, what happens when there's no brain activity and still people have experiences and report experiences and so forth. So what's the word you're using? Is it Tugtum. Tugtum. Oh, Tugtum. It's the, what is usually referred to as the clear light of death. We have two clear light of death. One's the ordinary being clear light of death, conventional clear light of death. And then Tugtum is, is that, when you're able to harness that energy and use it for meditation at that time. And you have the skill to do that. T-U-G-D-A-N. Yeah. In fact, there are in the in in Tibet as well, I don't know if outside Tibet, but in the sort of Tibetan culture, there are dialogues. And dialogues are those who've been able to travel to or experience other realms. And then, um, then they're seen as like um, healers being able to assist people in the death process as well, or illness. Mm. So it's saying, because it's based on the brains, a person cannot pass from one life to another rebirth. So they're dismissing that or having any kind of existence with a continuity of consciousness after death. So there was another quote that said that, you know, even though this is widely held view, we have no good explanation of why and how um, uh, why physical processes give rise to such a rift, rich inner life at all. It seems objectively unreasonable. That's, that's sensible. <laughs> And yet it does occur. And it's like, you've just contradicted yourself in your own theory. So might you decide to look at it differently? I don't think that quote's in the notes. Is it wrong? Um, I'd have to go back and look. Oh, okay. But that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it's still from... No, I, I won't say it is because I'm not sure. Okay. So then challenging this materialistic view, um, William James said that or suspected that attention is a mental state with a is a mental state, I'm just going to skip a bit, that allows us moment by moment to choose and sculpt how our ever-changing minds will work. This is, we're very comfortable with that, right? <laughs> to choose who we will be in the next moment in a, very real, in, a, in a very real sense. And those choices are left, well, embossed in physical form on all our material selves. So we might debate that. <laughs> but we do talk about being left embossed as imprints on our mental continuum. So he asserts a stream of consciousness. We'd say continuity of consciousness, which also asserts impermanence, which also asserts moment by moment. So we're very, it's very much closer to a Buddhist view, isn't it? 
and emotion, habit and will. He was very strong on the will. So we're getting closer and closer to a Buddhist presentation. And then as we sort of mentioned other views that challenge this, the neuroplasticity that the brain can be changed by experience, that there's a, a top-down process where consciousness causes changes in the brain. And so this is where you know, we have people coming up like Norman Doidge is saying, it, it, either the brain that changes itself, that's one um, set of theories, and the mind changing the brain, which is what we see through the neuroplasticity um, experiments and so forth. So um, you might just finish for today with this um, maybe a couple of quotes from Norman Doidge. Um, and and I, I sort of feel very fortunate, well, not sort of, I do feel very fortunate to have been um, at all the, uh, up until the last few years, happiness and its causes, conferences and mind and its potential. I know some other people at least have been to, to some of them and hear people like Norman Doidge present their scientific research. So his research is looking at people overcoming mental limitations or brain damage that were seen as unalterable. So, you know, people dealing with critical cases. Um, and it's interesting, this idea of it being, you know, having these limitations as being unalterable because, you know, for myself going back to, Feldenkrais and when I was training in Feldenkrais as a, as a body therapy and then you you know you show people different options for movement that they never thought possible so it's how the mind responds Feldenkrais would say he'd say you've got to bring the person home in other words bring them back to to what they know and just like incrementally uh, introduce different options otherwise we go into somatic retraction so he was very much focused on the body but we can see how you know it can challenge your sense of body image or your sense of self actually one woman who started coming along to film class classes she said she lost a lot of weight and she was an actor and she lost a lot of weight for her acting role and she said, but I still have this image of myself as big. And so it's a sort of dissonance I'm experiencing. I know I'm not that big, but I, you know, that's my self-perception. So we can look at that in terms of our own self-perceptions and how they correlate or don't correlate with reality. That's a good thing. Okay. I think I might stop. Uh, yeah, I think it's time to stop there for today. Any Further questions, comments? Uh, Matt. I sort of have two questions. Okay. okay. One, one question. Uh, so we've just covered a lot of ground. Yeah, we've covered a lot of ground. First, we thought that we've covered a lot of ground there. Yeah. But uh, I just wanted to, to see if you would sort of see. Okay. If you, if you would consider a difference between like a Western concept, which is attached to some of these things like the world, yeah. like the individual world, which is related to self-worth and intention, yeah. to have a will to do something, yeah. uh, to the, this Buddhist concept of intention. I, yeah, so I think, those two yeah. Natural, yeah. Not quite natural. Um. I don't think there's necessarily a, a contradiction because if we say there is will, what is that other than intention? You know, it's making a purposeful decision, isn't it? So we would have to correlate that with, from a, you know, we would say intention. And I guess because within the Western philosophical framework, it's all been about will and willpower and so forth. Um, it's bit those terminologies are used, but unless, yeah, I, I don't think there's a contradiction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I guess really interesting question now, I mean, I know many years ago, I was deep into cognitive science. 
yes. Uh, I've got to this point. There's, uh, I think there's a series of books now to tell our Lama in this course with Francisco Varela. Yes, that, that, uh, from, from, that's from that's right. The different conference. With the different conference the what, very... what struck me mm. was, was, was that I got to this problem, which might be not really interested in Southern Islam as a practical solution and Buddhist philosophy. Yes. What seems more useful because you got to this problem where, like, you're talking about the mind, but but we don't, we, we, what about our mind, my mind? I mean, as opposed to the mind, yeah, so yes, it's, like mind it's my mind, it's, it's a, about, it's an individual it's experience, like, what about yeah, and, yeah. And this, this is, I think Francisco Varela talks about like meeting, like going somewhere in Tibet, and then these scientists are whipping them, and say, there's this teacher or Lama or. Yeah, I think he wasn't. I think the, the, this expression that they were just wasn't attached to a school, right. yeah, like kind of like a one way. And then I said to him, Oh, well, we want to study you. He said, Oh, that's fine. Um, I'll show you how to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that was like the crux of a lot of these things for me because, like, we're here because of our existence. There's all these theories, but like we want to know what all those theories are in relation to how that's right. Is. How does this relate? So whatever our existence yeah. is, we don't know quite what it is, but it's somehow important to us, yeah. It, and then that's important to will and attention because we are will and intention and attention, we are those things ourselves, somehow, yeah. Well, we wouldn't say we are will and attention, but we have you know the mental factors that we have so. So, yeah, um, it all comes down to, yeah, there's no, I think when you, when you say study the brain, the mind, it does objectify it, whereas it does. It comes back to it is our personal experience through which we know. I just find it so interesting that as researchers, we're supposedly, supposedly we're supposed to be so trained on being objective and yes. rational. And we have all these theories and we don't accept them as a universal truth. We don't even see them as theories anymore. And they have all these consequences. That's right. The world. Like the, the theory that the brain generates the mind, like that's the theory, but we believe in it as if it is the truth. And then it goes on to potentially causing millions of people this, this, this fear of death because they believe that this is the truth and my brain is going to die. Yes. And I'm going to die. I'm going to die because my brain dies, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it, it is true that, yeah, and this is the thing, it, this is why we're looking at different scientific theories to see what are the consequences of that, of holding those views. They are views held. What are the consequences of that? How much do I hold that view? And how does that correlate with my own experience through meditation and so forth? How does, you know, what would be the, like having the consequences of there's nothing after this life is a huge lot of consequences, isn't it? So every different um, scientific aspect. And yeah, and then we say that's a theory that's therefore it's universally true. And when we use the word universally, it has to be true in every single circumstance, not be able to be refuted at all in any situation whatsoever. By anybody, no matter what their view. Hmm? Yeah, well, then that's, hard. that's a high concept. Yeah, but that's what the Buddha yeah. presented. Yeah. Tukdam. <laughs> Tukdam. Uh, is that? Is that only at the time of death? Yes. Oh. It's only at the time of death where you go through the dissolutions of the stages of death and a being who is, is able to, you know, say, okay, I'm going to go into that clear light of death rather than just be propelled into a next life, which is all the rest of us. And I'm going to meditate on this or that or the other thing. And I'm going to do it for X amount of time, right? So because it's the most subtle level of mind, right? We can access that most subtle level of mind at other times, access it. No, we can experience it, not necessarily access it at other times. 
but in terms of being able to use that in our meditation practice. I mean, it is possible for those who've done, who've attained completion stage highest yoga tantra, okay, that's a whole other area that can actually um, access that actual clear light. But that's why they look forward to the death time because it's the most subtle level of, of mind and you can use that to complete the path or whatever you decide. <laughs> we wish. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for today. Next week, there's no class because I'll be away on retreat myself. And uh, so we'll be back the following week, whatever day that is. Today's the 13th, 26th, 27, whatever it is. <laughs> Counting's not my forte, obviously. Um, so we'll dedicate. Recite the dedication prayers. I'm going the wrong way. Sancho Sancho Grimpo Shi Maki Panam Ge Kuchi Ke Panyam Pa Me Payang Gong Ne Gong Du Pelwa Shu in the long life prayers. We'll do in English. Page 19. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. And for Lama Zopa Rinpoche, page 22, if you have the book. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serves as a bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjana's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplishes magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, saviour of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. And Tenzin Osul's long life. Lord of Dharma, who in accordance with the various dispositions of those to be subdued, makes clear in the light of your well-spoken advice, the sacred Gandan tradition, essence of Buddha's teachings, O foremost and holy Lama, to you who are supreme, O Lama, please, please live long. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keep investigating. <laughs> <laughs>